A.G. Dickens fundamentally argues that the resurrection of the Pilgrimage of Grace was almost entirely the work of one man, Sir Francis Bigard. As a member of the landed gentry, a lawyer, and a supporter of Lutheranism, Dickens argues, Bigard saw an opportunity in the Risings of 1536 to take advantage of the separatist nature of the rebellion in order to achieve its, his own Reformation goals. Born 4th of October 1507, Bigard remains one of the best documented Englishmen of his status and period. He was descended from the two baronial lines of the Peters and the Bigards. While attending Oxford University, he closely exposed himself to Lutheranism and became a supporter of Martin Luther's theological views during his university education. In other words, he became a Protestant. He formed an acquaintance with Thomas Cromwell during a training school for higher officials and left university with a firm grasp of Latin, a keen interest in law, and an exceptional mastery of the English language, all of which would be helpful later on in his life. Like many of the northern gentry, Bigard had attempted to exclude himself from the uprisings in October 1536. This isn't very surprising, as he had little cause to quarrel with the king, and as a Protestant, had no strong religious opposition against the Reformation. However, he was captured by the commons, and bizarrely forced to lead them. He stayed in York because his fear of being harmed by his captors far outweighed his worries about committing treason. It appears that Bigard then spotted an opportunity in the power vacuum in the north of which he could take advantage in order to achieve his personal goals of reforming the church. Although for Protestantism, he was adamantly against politicians exerting their authority in ecclesiastical affairs. He wrote, for example, to the Earl of Westmoreland, stressing the unfairness of the new prior's appointment by Thomas Cromwell. Despite not being representative of any popular Catholicism in England, he did seem to be a mouthpiece for the common man's opposition to secular meddling in the church. It should be noted that Bigard's active involvement in the first part of the Pilgrimage of Grace was actually very small. He did not attend the Pilgrim's Council at York in November 1536. But he did play a small role in the declaration of the rebels' demands in the council at Pontefract Castle in December 1536, where he wrote an extensive memorandum on church and state, and how they should be separate. According to Bigard, the church was to be run on a national scale, separately from the Pope, but crucially by holy men. The role of the king was only as a secular defender of the national church, not as its leader. To quote his own words, the king should, with the sword, defend all spiritual men in their right. By the end of the Pilgrimage of Grace, round one, so to speak, Bigot had developed very strong views against secular interference and authority over the church. Furthermore, he was still against the dissolving of any monasteries. He wished to reform them all instead of getting rid of them altogether. When the rebellion dispersed itself after the king's pardon in December 1536, he returned home to Mulgrave, but foresaw himself being in a very dangerous spot. He was extremely suspicious of the nature of the king's pardon and promises, and knew that he would be targeted if the king re-established his control over the north. Bigard travelled to Watton in Norfolk, where he met a companion who he had originally met during the rebellion. After pointing out the flaws in the king's promises, he persuaded him and a few others to renew the arousal of the north. His plan was to take Hull and Scarborough and hold them until the parliament that they had been promised actually took place. In addition, another core of the plan was that when the Duke of Norfolk came, the king's royal commander, he was to be captured and made to swear to help them, or used as a hostage. The strategy of Bigard's plans is actually very impressive. Hull and Scarborough were both vital to the king's control of the north. However, his tact is in stark contrast with his apparent blindness to the social psychology of the North itself. Many, if not most people, had complete trust in the king and his pardon was generally trusted. And almost all conservative religious people had now realised Bigard's Protestant intentions. He had absolutely nobody to help him. This was recognisably reflected on the 16th of January 1537, when Bickard tried to organise a muster of men, but practically none of the gentry turned up. Some of the gentlemen, including Robert Ask, actually completely rejected his ideas and even worked against the spread of his rising. 
Feeling completely betrayed by his own class, Bigot threw himself in with the commons. The military side of the uprising was a completely embarrassing defeat. John Hallam was defeated and captured outside Hull. Lumley, one of the very few gentlemen involved, failed to enter the virtually unguarded castle at Scarborough, and Bigard was again defeated at Hull. After losing in battle, he became a hunted fugitive. He was arrested in a chapel in Cumberland on the 10th of February 1537, and later hung, drawn and quartered in the north. Contrary to some belief, Francis Bigger did not die for the old faith. He died a firm Protestant. He opposed the king not in a classical Catholic versus Protestant manner, but because of his different and conflicting interpretation of Protestantism itself. He had originally welcomed royal supremacy over the church, hoping that it might cause a reformation towards active evangelism and rational church government. Only once Henry began shutting down monasteries and acting aggressively did he begin to attack his involvement in Cromwell's extort power. A.G. Dickens makes a strong case for Bigard's leading involvement with the Risings in 1537. However, while his explanations for Bigard's motives are clear, is it not difficult to believe that a single member of the gentry, isolated by his peers, could even cause a ripple in the North's stability? We couldn't help but feel that Dickens concentrated so heavily on Bigard himself that he might overlook the drive from above and below his social class. Although Dickens does briefly mention Bigard's involvement with the Percy family, he does not, we felt, explore in full the involvement and impetus from the Percys and their followers, who, as you all know, had a good reason to oppose the king at this time. Nor does he give the hundreds of commons much credit for their taking part. On the contrary, he seems to make out the commons to be like pawns on a chessboard, easily manoeuvred around by the leadership of one member of the gentry. Again, Dickens does not explore in enough detail the grievances of the common man in the Second Rising. That said, Bigot himself is proven to be the glue holding the pilgrimage round two together, and Dickens does succeed in explaining, at least on the most part, how the unsatisfactory results of the first rebellion inevitably led to the second.